when I asked Ed to speak about local government units in Kansas, he came up with what I think is a fun topic, Kansans love government. Please join me in giving Ed Flingy a warm Packard Urban Club welcome. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction I wrote for you, uh, <laughs> John. <laughs> um, it's very nice to be uh, invited to the Pachyderm Club. I, and I'd, I'd want to stop and uh, just comment that uh, uh, I'm really impressed uh, with the work of the two Johns, but uh, John Todd uh, particularly uh, puts together, uh, I think, excellent programs. Uh, the attendance uh, indicates that and uh, assures that the group has some diverse voices. And uh, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not a member, <clears throat> I'm afraid I'd get uh, kicked out uh, if I <laughs> applied. <laughs> yeah, the check has to clear. But I want uh, at least to publicly uh, compliment uh, John Todd for uh, keeping this a lively uh, kind of uh, program. And I certainly hope after you hear me that you don't fire him. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's got, uh, he's got still um, things to go. And uh, so, John didn't tell you the whole story uh, when he said, why don't you talk about local government? I said, J John, that's a boring subject. You know, are you sure? And after I th thought about it a while, I said, well, let's go with the title, Kansans Love Government. And he looked at me and kind of said, Ed, this is a pachyderm club. Uh, are, I'm not sure. Uh, you want to go there? And I said, oh, maybe it'll wake some folks up and uh, be a, uh, a way to talk about uh, a subject that uh, might make some folks' uh, eyes glaze over. <clears throat> anyway, here we go, if I can make this work. The best source for uh, counting governments uh, is done by the U.S. Census Bureau. They count, uh, they have a census of governments across the country every five years. And um, uh, this little chart here gives uh, the latest report, which is 2012, um, and I kind of put it in a little different context uh, because usually early in the week we're checking to see how the Shockers are ranked nationally or the Jayhawks. And uh, so I thought I'd just present this as a way uh, that we rank governments. And most of these uh, governments are familiar and some may not be, but uh, We've had 105 counties for some time. We actually consolidated a couple quite a while back. Um, if To be technical, if you went to the 2012 uh, Census of Governments, it would say that we have 103 counties. Uh, I don't view it that way. The folks back in Washington said that. But they said, said it because uh, Kansas City, Kansas, and Wyandotte County consolidated, and they decided to classify that as a municipal government or a city government rather than a county government. But they perform county functions, and the folks out in uh, uh, Greeley County, I think it is, uh, and Tribune consolidated. I may be wrong with uh, those numbers or those t names, but... Uh, so we have two uh, counties that actually consolidated with cities, the larger cities in their jurisdiction. But I'm going to count that. It uh, doesn't change the ranking. 
Number five, in counties, cities. Um, the number of cities has been stable for some time. Um, the uh, city of uh, Bel Air got formed uh, in the mid 80s. Um, a little neighborhood uh, outside of Ark City got in a flap with over annexation uh, a few years back <clears throat> and uh, uh, formed, uh, I think it's Parker Field, uh, has about uh, three or 400 folks in it. Uh, it's a city essentially that uh, doesn't uh, perform its functions. It contracts basically all its functions with the county, as I understand. Uh, the county commission uh, had, a, had a request from neighbors uh, up uh, west of Valley Center to create Valley West. That got turned down. Um, and you got a couple commissioners that were involved in that may be able to talk a little more about that. <clears throat> Townships are actually a declining uh, number uh, in Kansas and across the country. Um, I was involved uh, peripherally in a study requested by the city of Wichita and Sedgwick County in the uh, uh, early 90s. Uh, looking at primarily merger of the city and the county. And uh, that study group recommended the abolishment of townships. And it was one of my learning experiences about the value of townships. I remember uh, being out at the, the auditorium at the zoo, having a, a public uh, forum on the issue of abolishing townships in Sedgwick County. And I don't think there was anyone in the crowd wanting to abolish townships. And I remember um, someone, one person standing up, if you abolish townships, who is going to take care of our road when it snows? Who do I call? And. Uh, uh, there was an adamant group about saving the townships. Now, a little disclosure, I'm now living in a township, and like all Kansas, I love my township. <laughs> they take care of the streets really well. So I want to... Uh, want to say I'm uh, now in the loving township category. Uh, 306 uh, school districts, that includes both community college districts, school districts, actually Washburn Municipal University as well. Um, you probably read, if you keep track of the news, news in uh, Topeka, a uh, legislator from uh, up in the northeast uh, part of the state uh, had a plan to abolish one or two hundred uh, school districts. Um, that got a little press and then quickly got buried. Uh, so we're not going to change that number, I don't think, this year. Uh, special districts, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about. It's a little more of a, I think, a less, uh, a more confusing subject. But if you add them all up, uh, in the state of Kansas, uh, 3,826, according to the Census Bureau, um, number six in the nation. Now, who's ahead of us? We're always concerned in our ranking, who's ahead of us? It's California, it's Texas, it's Illinois, it's Pennsylvania, and Ohio slipped ahead of us in the last five years. Well, I'm going to send uh, Bob Weeks to his computer, but I'm here to claim, without any calculation, that Kansans rank number one in the country per capita in their love of government. <laughs> 
number, were number one compared to the residents of all the other states in the union. So there you are. Now I could stop now and take questions, <laughs> but let me move on. Um, there's, I got a couple brain waves. These numbers must be prompt up because of Johnson County, or Wyandotte, or Shawnee, or Wichita County. Who's bumped these numbers up? Well, I'm here to say Sedgwick County folks love government too. 20 cities tied for first in the state, 27 townships, fourth school districts, number one, 36 uh, special districts, number nine overall, and these are uh, numbers are somewhat dated, but overall, we're number one. We love governments as well as any county in Kansas. So there. So what does this turn into? Now this was a chart put together 20 years ago or so, 1990. But when you look at, at these governments, and just really uh, the county, cities, and townships, you find something like this. We've got 47 road departments. Can you beat that? And don't you dare touch our county are my township road department. Uh, only 22 sewer departments, 20 some Noxer Swedes. These numbers are probably a little changed from uh, when this uh, study was done. But we're in the government business in a real way. Now, the concept of special districts is probably a little obtuse. What are these things? 1,829 special districts across the state of Kansas, according to the Census Bureau. What exactly are these? Uh, this is kind of a standard definition. A category of local governments established to perform a limited purpose, presumably one not performed by general purpose local governments, such as a city or a county. Um, separately governed, largely invisible in many cases. Boundaries may overlap uh, with cities and counties, but also states. And it is the fastest growing category of local governments in the country. And so what are these, these things? Well, I'm not going to list or talk about every one of these, but these are some examples, and this is not uh, comprehensive. Cemetery districts, airport authorities, conservation districts, groundwater management, hospital districts, improvement districts, irrigation, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, if you want to talk about any of these later, we can uh, kind of back up and talk about them, but the point is, um, we uh, have lots of special districts, and again, just looking at Sedgwick County, again, this is 1991, I would be surprised if there aren't a couple more since then. A li regional library, and the number is seven plus one cemetery districts, uh, we've got seven inside the county, one cross county lines, Fire district, hospital district, drainage districts, uh, improvement districts, watershed districts. Uh, that makes up our 36, uh, I think, in the county. So, the Census Bureau counts 1,829 special districts. It doesn't count, nobody counts the special districts created by cities and counties across the state. And 
I haven't done an inventory of the ones that have been created in uh, Sedgwick County or the city of Wichita or Derby or whatever. But here are some examples, obviously. Benefit districts of various kinds, fire districts, library boards. Uh, some of these are, get a little, whoop. Some of these get a little more attention in the news. Um, redevelopment districts, um, often called TIF districts, um, uh, self-supported uh, municipal district, ground, uh, <coughs> Wichita Downtown Development Corporation, I think's the name, uh, land banks, lighting districts. Uh, we now have a new category, fairly new, community improvement districts. So. The 1800 uh, that the Census Bureau counts doesn't include any of these. And uh, these are uh, significant, uh, often quite significant. Let me put up a third category of governments that, uh, uh, and that, this is based on another study done by the university uh, five or six years ago, there are in uh, Sedgwick County, according to the study, uh, nearly 3,500 nonprofit organizations. Now, why, why should I bring these up? Well, most of them, 90% of them, maybe 95% of them are, are not a, uh, uh, don't affect us in any way, but here are some that are fairly uh, prominent. Uh, Greater Wichita YMCA, uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau, Starkey, a big nonprofit, uh, the Zoological Society, uh, probably not on many folks' uh, wavelength, but uh, actually run the zoo. Uh, down to, or the Greater Wichita Economic Development Coalition, Downtown Development, Exploration Place, Workforce Alliance. Those are fairly significant uh, operations, uh, often um, operated with uh, tax dollars. And uh, uh, just to, uh, the university did a uh, study for Sedgwick County now 15 years ago or so. And I think we learned uh, that these nonprofit organizations that deliver public services with taxpayer money are a, it's a significant phenomenon in, uh, in our community. It was kind of an eye opener and some of the subjects that uh, they deal with, mental health, substance abuse, developmental disabilities, Tourism, healthcare, so on. I put healthcare twice. John, you told me you're going to take the typos out. I was trying to. I was obviously trying to make the list more impressive. I, again, this is just a uh, a uh, beginning. This is not an exhaustive list. Now, one of the experts in the field calls these nonprofits that uh, deliver services with taxpayer money um, third-party governments. And he describes them as an elaborate system of third-party government in which crucial elements of public authority are shared with a host of non-governmental or other governmental actors, frequently in complex, collaborative systems that sometimes defy <laughs> comprehension. And I, I'm sure that is true. And moving on, the same expert in the field says, third party governments include commercial banks, private hospitals, social service agencies, industrial corporations, universities, daycare centers, other levels of government, financiers, construction firms, 
that deliver publicly financed public services and pursue publicly authorized purposes. So we've got, we've got the governments that the Census Bureau tracks, 3,800 in Kansas. We've got um, the government's special districts created by cities and counties. And then we've got nonprofit uh, third-party governments that are very active in delivering public services. So John says, why? <laughs> why explain this to me? When did this start? Help me. Well, I'm here to say it started when folks landed <laughs> on our shores. I don't recall Native Americans creating these. The folks escaping from religious persecution landed. And actually, before they got off the boat, they said, we do buy these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves into a civic body politic. And by virtue here of to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, offices, from time to time, as shall be thought, most meet and convenient for the general good, under which we promise all due submission and obedience. Now that is what we call in this field of government the covenant tradition. We covenant and combine ourselves into a civic politics and, uh, and that um, has resulted, in my view, in government from the bottom up. Uh, and I would uh, argue, at least, that this goes way back, goes essentially to the start of this country. The Frenchman, uh, Tocqueville, uh, visited in the early uh, 19th century and made some observations that uh, I think uh, support my argument. The first, the township was organized before the county, the county before the state, and the state before the union. He essentially said, that's how we form governments, from the bottom up. And further, municipal independence, in other words, these independent governments in the United States is therefore a natural consequence of the very principle of the sovereignty of the people. And about the same time, de Tocqueville also observed what, uh, uh, what we call the nonprofit sector, these, this multitude of uh, nonprofit organizations, which he described as a distinctive and critical feature of American life. He's observing early 19th century. And he particularly noted that in Europe, power and responsibility gravitated to centralized authority, whereas in the US, power and responsibility emerged through individuals in voluntary associations at the community level. So um, just a bit further on this, uh, a philosopher on democracy, uh, John Stuart Mill, a uh, little later, made a couple observations that I think are relevant to this bottom-up uh, concept. Government operations tend to be everywhere alike with individuals and voluntary associations. On the contrary, there are varied experiments and endless diversity of experience. 
Americans insist on a vibrant nonprofit sector as a guarantor of their liberties and a mechanism to ensure a degree of pluralism. So, a little typo in the title there, sorry about that. Why do Kansans love government? Government represents Kansans' expression of freedom and individual liberty as, democ as a democracy based on freedom and individual liberty, Kansans may freely join together to form governments to their liking. Kansans proudly and widely practice the covenant tradition brought to the U.S. shores nearly 400 years ago. So, John, Kansans love government. <laughs> and they love, love them widely and broadly, and uh, uh, in a sense, you've got more government to complain about. Uh, there's you no know, lack of uh, opportunity to criticize, and, uh, and so I'll just leave it there, and uh, for any questions, uh, be happy to try to respond. Thank you, Dr. Flingy. Um, you may be right that Kansans love government, but I think that the key here is that Kansans love local control. Do you agree with that or disagree? Well, that's uh, that's uh, municipal sovereignty. Yeah, sure. Although, let let's let's be honest about it. Uh, anybody who has been watching the Kansas legislature over the last few years could probably, and I'm sure the mayor uh, could, have a long list, a laundry list of folks who operate in Topeka believing they are, have more wisdom about uh, a variety of things than uh, local officials and locally elected folks. So there's always a struggle uh, there. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, Kansas has a home rule, city home rule provision in its constitution uh, that's fairly reasonably effective. But uh, uh, there, it's a constant struggle between uh, uh, state and local governments. So it looked like a lot of those, not the third level government, but a lot of those sub-level governments may have been formed for the purpose of being able to tax the group they wanted to serve. Is that always true, or what did you see? I, I would argue that, and there are, ex, uh, there are some exceptions. I, am, I would acknowledge exceptions to this bottom up. But I would argue it is normally taxpayers getting together to form a government, neighbors getting together, property owners getting together, and uh, in most cases, uh, you've got the city or the county or even the state uh, giving a final approval. But when you have a focused group of neighbors saying, we got to have a cemetery district to bury our folks, I mean, uh, or we got to have a watershed district, or we got to have this, that, or the other. Um, it is, uh, uh, it's, I don't think it's easy for uh, uh, city or county officials to say, no, you can't do that. We're not, we're not going to do that. Their alternative would be, let us take care of it, and, and that's usually not a good alternative. Next question over here, Paul. Uh, doctor, maybe I missed it, but I didn't notice you listing the homeowners association. Some of those folks sure <laughs> act like they're government officials, and they take you to court if you do something they don't like. No, uh, that would probably fit in the nonprofit category. I mean, those are, uh, I, I don't think they're profit, in most cases, profit. So they'd be in a category. I. Sh I'll get an amendment to this uh, <laughs> next time I do it, but that's a good point. I mean, 
I've lived in two homeowners uh, association districts, and they're a government, uh, a little democracy, and uh, they have some dictators and, and uh, <laughs> cliques, and it's it's got all the all the problems of democracy. I didn't see it, but maybe I missed it. My vision isn't very good. But where were the voluntary agencies in Kansas that handle the refugee services? Refugee? I can't answer that question. Sorry, I I don't know the answer to that. As I make my way around the room, just a reminder, I'll get our packet or Let me let me back up on that, and I truthfully I don't know, but it's. I would guess it's often churches. It's a nonprofit. I mean, a huge number of those nonprofit organizations are churches, and they act as instruments of uh, the federal government, essentially in handling refugees. Professor, will you be uh, available at President Trump's coronation? <laughs> that sounds like more like a speech than a question. I, I noticed that uh, none of the local governments were mentioned in here. Where, where does uh, the justice system come in and say, you know, the legality of, of these uh, bottom up, bottom to the top versus down to the bottom. The justice system? Legal system. Yeah, the legal system. Well, uh, in any, any one of those, you can find its legal foundation. Uh, nonprofits uh, are formed uh, through the Internal Revenue Service, U.S. Internal Revenue Service. Uh, I, I don't know what, what's the Status of the Pachyderm Club. Are you a nonprofit or are you incorporated or not? Undercover. What? <laughs> <laughs> One of those publicly invisible groups. Well, if you are incorporated, you had to go to the IRS, make an application. So that's that. Uh, if, I, if I'm a downtown developer and I want a redevelopment district, I've got to put my act together and go to the city council. If I uh, want a um, benefit district uh, outside of the city, I've got to go to the county commission and get their sign off. So uh, these, uh, there is some oversight uh, to these uh, government. Somebody's a sign-off. Uh, watershed districts, I think, would have to go to the uh, uh, Kansas Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, water districts uh, often have to go there. So, But uh, obviously the resistance, somebody stopping this, has not happened often in our dear state. Uh, would you comment on the uh difference between the political differences between western Kansas and the eastern part of the state. Uh, if you recall about 20 years ago, there was a group out in western Kansas that actually <coughs> formed a petition to secede from, from the state and form their own state, whether that be the state of western Kansas. Yeah. Because of the political divisions, they felt like they were sending all their money to Topeka and not getting anything back. And uh, do you see that as a potential growth of division between western and the eastern part of the state? This argument's been going on for more than 100 years. Uh, uh, fellows studied uh, state fin finance uh, in the early 20th century and uh, observed how money was flowing, tax money was flowing from uh, uh, eastern Kansas to western Kansas. Um, the fuss in southwest Kansas you're talking about was in response to when the legislature said we're going to have a uniform mill levy for schools. And uh, before that, 
uh, and I, I'm trying to think exactly the time frame of that. Uh, before that, uh, essentially uh, for school finance, uh, each local district could set the levy at its, uh, at its uh, desired level. Uh, and the legislature said we're going to have a uniform levy because of the uh, wealth in uh, southwest Kansas. Essentially, it forced their levy up, and some districts uh, went down. And so that was quite a fuss for a while. Uh, uh, their efforts to succeed came up short. And, uh, but the real underlying conflict, in my view, is uh, no, nothing, no big surprise here, but uh, uh, we've had population decline in uh, rural Kansas for a hundred years, uh, some counties steadily. I grew up in Harper County, and uh, I would guess the peak uh, population in Harper County was, uh, I don't know, maybe the 40s or 50s. And, um, and yet, uh, these folks don't want to give up county governments. They don't want to con consolidate school districts. Uh, I, my parents were in the middle of a fuss over school consolidation in the early 60s and lost. And uh, uh, it's a struggle just to maintain a quality of life, uh, their way of life. And uh, I think the, the real struggle is over that. It's the cost. Of, one of my colleagues called it the cost of space. It is more costly to deliver high quality schools or any kind of public services when you're in a, dealing in a sparsely populated area than it is in an urban area. Doctor, what do you see for the future? Uh, millennials, uh, do you see them as involved as the <coughs> this system. What, uh, what is your forecast for the voter population in the future? That's a big question. I'm not sure I have an answer. Uh, you have to be struck. I'm struck with this Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. I mean, he has captured the imagination of folks that are probably, are young. We can call them immature, inexperienced, unknowledgeable. Un, uh, uh, but uh, he's done that. Uh, now, is that a majority? No, it's not. But um, I, the, you look at the younger uh, population, uh, they're, there's a different set of values. And uh, I mean, my son and daughter are living different lives than uh, I ever expected, and certainly that I lived. And, uh, and they're going to have some influence on the future and how it takes shape. And, you know, on something like uh, same sex marriage, I mean, it just. Uh, my son works for the Justice Department. We were out in Colorado together 15 years ago, and this same-sex issue was boiling. And uh, he's a fairly savvy attorney, and uh, he kind of said, it's a non-issue, you know. And I, I was, I guess I was like Obama. I was evolving. <laughs> <laughs> on the subject, but uh, I, I didn't see that at all. And that's just one of, I think, many issues where uh, younger folks are going to bring different uh, perspectives and values to, into political life. Right here, next question. Okay, so that is really a lot of government. So and it seems like it has a propensity to continue to grow. So do we get 
less efficient by growing more complicated? Because whenever it gets more complicated, it seems like more mistakes, more overlap, more costs. So what's, what is your thought? Which, where, how should we be moving? Should some of those governments be out of there? Or the, uh, and I'm thinking specifically in Michigan where we had this lead issue, and it seems like governments tripped over themselves. Well, if you believe in individualism and free markets, you learn. These governments learn. They learn from each other. They learn from their mistakes. I mean, if uh, Sedgwick County had one road department rather than 47, um, would we be better off? Um, uh, I don't know this, but I would say the... Uh, uh, the jurisdiction around Beijing has one road department. And uh, as I said, I've come to love townships. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, uh, it is experimentation. Uh, it, and it's, I don't think it's more expensive. If we consolidated 47 road departments in Sedgwick County, in the one, would quality service improve at a lower cost? I doubt it. Um, the, the township where I live, I think, got a two-man <laughs> road crew, and they always seem to be out finding something to do uh, for the public good. So I'm. Uh, I'm not, I, I think if you looked, if I had given this talk uh, 25 years ago, I would have probably had a different perspective. I, uh, my love of the township and, uh, and, and standing before those folks out at the zoo <laughs> uh, has changed my uh, view of that. Next question here. Yeah, we really appreciate you being here today. It's been fun. You uh, spent some time with the U.S. Senator. You spent time with the governor's office. And you were in a city manager for a while, for city of Wichita. Did the, your experiences, the working on the local level, did that change your perspective and you share something about that? I, I'm a big state and local government advocate. Um, I, I, Alice Rivlin, former budget director of the U.S., um, a brilliant thinker and writer, um, talked about a concept of how we deal with federalism, states, local governments, and all of this. And she argued for a division of labor between uh, the federal government and local and state and local government and uh, for example she argued that uh, the uh, federal government was very good at writing checks uh, Social Security uh, <coughs> Medicare health payments and would argue that a good bit of the federal what's now the federal government could be um, uh, shifted to the states. At the time, and she wrote this 15 or 20 years ago, uh, that started some discussion along those lines, but it never went very far. And um, we've got all sorts of federal agencies that are some congressmen's dream and and they get created they just stick around and I don't think we figured out a way to essentially uh, we'll make the federal establishment more lean uh, our congressman is after the EDA uh, economic development administration I think it's need and uh, of course there's a sign plopped up on campus about this huge building that's going up with the EDA money. And so it's always 
it's always, it's an ongoing struggle, and uh, uh, I've always been a skeptic that uh, the folks in Washington can figure out. I mean, if you talked about the big, the Great Society era and Lyndon Johnson, I mean, they were creating federal programs for everything from rat control to you name it, and uh, uh, we've never figured out a way to uh, effectively uh, lean that up. That's a bad way to say it, but uh, I just don't think we have. Dr. Flinchy, with your uh, experience now uh, in, in uh, reference to the relationship between city and county, uh, would you recommend for or against uh, the kind of uh, city-county uh, uh, partnership that we have in, like, say, Wine.com? Well, let me say at one time uh, at the university, at the request of the city and the county, the study came out called Partnership 21 that recommend merger. And it didn't go very far uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm, I guess my view has changed a bit. Um, uh, the city and the county and the urban areas have overlapping duties overlapping jurisdictions and it would seem logical that uh, they work together on things I think that's happened reasonably well um, uh, so I, I I'm not a big advocate of merging them uh, there are some reasons uh, that merger might work. The merger movement hasn't gone gangbusters nationwide in in this area. Well, I think this will be our last one. Lindy, uh, wouldn't one of the solutions to these departments that we form have them all be sunset so they have to be reauthorized after a certain period of time <laughs> they just have grown aimlessly and inefficient? Seemed like it, doesn't it? Uh, in other words, do a sunset, but uh, once you create something, there's always a constituency out there for its continuation. And uh, uh, a few things get cut out every once in a while, but uh, the sunsetting was tried. Uh, 20 years ago across the country. It didn't do much, uh, that at the state level. Uh, you know, the federal government gets into uh, trying to, uh, authorizing and reauthorizing and they get, they get stalled and, and they're stalemate and so things just, just kind of kick the can down the road. Dr. Ed Flangey, let's get it.